Bom dia a todos. Aqui é a Simone Hauck, professora da Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul e presidente do Centro de Estudos do Luiz Guedes. Nós estamos aqui em Santo Luiz visitando a Universidade de Washington, a Universidade de Santo Luiz e o Instituto Antropídia, que é uma fundação sem fins lucrativos. Uh, essa é uma visita muito importante para nós nesse momento em que uh, precisamos unir esforços para fazer diferença no que vem acontecendo no mundo. Uh, o, o, a jornada fala sobre a união mente-corpo, então a antropídia trabalha bastante com essa questão, com a questão do bem-estar. E eu vou conversar um pouquinho hoje então com o professor Robert Cloninger da Universidade de Washington e da Antropídia Foundation e com o professor Kevin Cloninger da Universidade de Santo Luís e da Antropídia Foundation, então vamos ouvi-los um pouco sobre o trabalho deles e o que, é que eles podem nos ensinar aqui. Yes, yeah, so uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you all from a great distance. Um, we at Antropedia we've been trying to address a, a serious issue, which is the increase, the rapid increases in depression and anxiety, and really every disease. Uh, related to stress and lifestyle in the world, which, as you all know, is part of the uh, five leading causes of death from you know, cancer and heart disease to respiratory illness and other things. And we've been trying to understand what the real source of those problems are. Why are so many more people dealing with depression, struggling with anxiety? Um, and When we really look at you know, what was the source of these problems, um, we realized that at some fundamental level, uh, it related to our lifestyles in the modern world. And fundamentally, um, it's the speed of change of our lifestyles over the course of 50 to 60 years, which has led to this precipitous increase in rates of uh, depression and anxiety. And so, if you just think back about, you know, what would your great-great-grandparents think about the way you're living right now, right? And I think there you can really see um, the true nature of the problem, which is that in a very short period of time, almost every aspect of human life, human lifestyle, changed. Um, if we just look again at population size alone, we, we went from 3 billion people in 1960 to 7.4 billion people today. You know, if we look at diet and lifestyle and exercise habits, things have fundamentally changed in a, in a very, very short period of time. And if we adopt an even wider lens through um, the history of evolution and the history of our species, um, we can see there's basically almost never been a period where there's been so many changes in such a short amount of time. And superficially, you know, we feel like we're adapting to that, but actually we're not. Um, the brain can only change so quickly, our genes can only change so quickly. Um, and so we're, essentially our bodies and our minds are being stressed in new ways um, that we've never had to face as a species. And a lot of the strategies that we're reaching for to cope with this are also from an ancient past. So it's not working in the same way. Even our habits, you know, in a distant past where we would look for sugar and salt in our environment in order that we would um, deal with that highly limiting nutrient and be able to ingest it on a regular basis. Now, it's ubiquitous in our environment. It's everywhere. And so we're getting way too much of it on a regular basis. And so we have to learn how to change those lifestyle habits We need to learn to live in a different era. Um, and it's really these qualities like um, love and creativity and intuition, and um, these things that make us uniquely human that are going to allow us to adapt to a new world, a new life, um, and do it with less depression, with less anxiety. Um, and so this was a very ambitious project. Um, we're a, a charity here in the United States and we needed a lot of help to develop the adequate resources to actually change our lifestyle. And so we um, drew on uh, research from a wide variety of fields, um, 
from psychology to psychiatry and medicine to education and ecological approaches, sociology, anthropology, um, but even uh, the humanities. We needed help from artists and dancers and musicians and others to try to formulate um, educational resources and treatment approaches that could actually help somebody um, fundamentally change their lifestyle. And so um, part of our story was um, we reached out to Dr. C. Robert Boninger, who I called dad, it's easier. Um, and we asked him to help us find um, experts in these different fields that could actually inform our methods, our research, and our education. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Well, I had for many years uh, been interested in the question of what's a healthy personality. And I had gone about this in stages that forced me to move from rather simple ideas of biological reductionism to broader, broader uh, sources of knowledge about who a human being is, what a human being's nature really is. And at the beginning, I had looked at habits and temperament as the basis for our healthy personality. And so the idea then was rather than being extreme, we should simply have rather moderated temperaments and be kind of average. But it turned out that that was not enough, that uh, we really had to bring in information from humanism to understand what a person's character is that gives them the capacity to intentionally, deliberately regulate their emotional drives, which are irrational and you just can't decide to moderate. But then, so at that point we had biology and we had the psychology of, of intentional behavior, goal-directed behavior, but I still couldn't explain the, uh, the, the chronology, the, the, the dynamics of change that allowed a person to motivate themselves to live a healthier lifestyle. And I realized that this is really something that takes place in self-awareness, in our narrative of our own identity as a creative life project. And so this brought in spirituality. And so something that had begun by a focus on just the biology of the body, and there are the habits that we condition our body to, to live with, uh, had to bring in humanism character traits like self-directedness, cooperativeness, but then finally we also had to accept that a truly creative, flexible person was someone who had ideas that allowed them to identify with something beyond their individual self. And that brings up the existential question of spirituality. So from the beginning, we realized that uh, we couldn't have simple theories, but that we had to address body, thought, and soul. And so then we have to mobilize and coordinate the knowledge of all these different fields and all these experts and be able to work with the Anthropedia Foundation, which has broader interests and educational skills rather than just the focus of many uh, medical schools and grants, uh, grant getting institutions to uh, see what's popular these days. We had to bring in the choreographers and the philosophers and the experts in literature to help us tap all of the knowledge from many, many different fields. And that now has given us a, a knowledge base that has allowed the Anthropedia Foundation to bring together experts from all these different fields and develop educational curriculum to uh, really distribute this and to train coaches, people who can train other people. And we're happy to be able to operate and collaborate with nonprofits in other parts of the world because this is not just a United States problem or a South American problem or a European problem. It really involves the whole world. And it's my understanding that the, most of the people that we're watching us today are working in health-related fields. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think, I think one of the most important things that we've learned over the last 15 or 20 years is basically that 
if we really want to help people face the challenges of our time, we have to get out of these strict silos, these boxes that we found ourselves in. Mostly, I think, because of economic expediency or that's the way it's always been done, right? That, that the whole problem we're having right now is that there isn't a good interdisciplinary approach that integrates the mind and the body approaches. And I think as we're all in different countries facing different kinds of challenges, I think we really have to think about um, right now our bias is to talk. Yeah, I agree with you. Always. We talk. We talk. And we have to figure out how do we do more than talk with the people that we're serving. We have to do both body approaches and mental approaches. And even if we don't um, directly address spiritual issues, um, we have to show the evidence to people that people that live uh, a more meaningful life or that feel that there is a deeper spiritual meaning to the world tend to be happier. So even if, you know, it's pragmatic, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And we know that just to reach people in any kind of talk therapy, we have to have conditions that involve communication of hope and respect and appreciation of the dignity of each person. And so there are always these spiritual qualities to our social communication in effective working alliances. And so we're, you know, we're talking about spirituality here. We're not talking about any particular religious dogma. We're talking about a way of relating to people that respects their full humanity with dignity. Yeah, I totally agree with the need of the talk. You know, maybe you can explain a little more for the audience the, the definition of spirituality, because I guess uh, in our country at least it gets very confused with religion and uh, yeah. and it came up some prejudice about the, the topic. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think spirituality is one of the hardest words to pin down precisely because it leaves these narrow confines of um, reflection and, and analytic thought. And so I think part of the problem in the communication is that spirituality has much more to do with a sense of connection that we have with anything that transcends us. You know, my father can speak even more about this, but in other words, it's that it's an experience of the transcendent, which obviously leaves the confines of an institutional approach to, say, a religious approach. But I think it, um, part of the essence of it is having a sense of contact or um, uh, connection to something greater than ourselves. And we see that kind of spirituality of transcendence in many of the people that we work with who are atheists you know, who value things like ethics, uh, compassion, um, you know, justice and, and uh, equality. Uh, those are ideals, they're transcendent. Mm -hmm. They transcend the individual's perspectives, but yet they actually help us um, uh, feel more connected to the people around us and the world as a whole. So I think part of it is just understanding that um, what's spiritual isn't only um, some con a notion of contact with the divine, but also simply contact with things which go beyond the individual. And I think what's useful about the TCI precisely is that it gets away from these purely religious, it's, it's a very tired argument basically. It's religion versus spirituality sometimes we say. And it's, not, it's even more complex than that, because you can be religious and spiritual, religious, not spiritual, spiritual, not religious. <laughs> you know, there's lots of, and so I think it, I think the notion of self-transcendence yes. puts it right where it needs to be. And then I think then we understand in fact that anyone working in a professional life wants something transcendent. In fact, most of what we call vocations, whether it's teaching, psychology, medicine, it's a calling for what, you know? Yeah. It's a calling to share transcendently um, with, you know, other people. I think um, it's very, very important to clarify this because uh, our world, you know, has came to a point where individuality and the, the look for profit yeah. has put us in a very difficult situation. Definitely. 
So I think that uh, we have having a concept of life self transcendence is a good way to have a perspective on a different way of relating with ourselves, with yeah. the world, with others. So I think it's a, a very important work that you are doing here. Okay. Self transcendence includes many different components. That includes our our aspirations for ourselves, like our ideals. It includes a, a sense of connectedness to people so that you have altruistic feelings and you want to serve others. It, it includes a sense of connection to nature so that you simply appreciate the beauties and the wonders and the mysteries that you see all around you. It includes a, an interest in exploring what you can't directly perceive with your physical senses, but you have some intuition that there's some presence that's sacred or that, that inspires you, that, that you want to understand what, what could be the source of love, but you can't see love, but you feel it. And so we, when we let ourselves be calm enough and to look inside of ourselves, we get in touch with something that itself, itself is, is sacred and precious. And I think all of us have this to some degree. And as Kevin said, it could be a devotion to truth and a very skeptical scientist who wants to you know, see the facts. But he does that with a, such a passion and respect for truth that, that there, that's really spiritual. And so I get many letters and emails from uh, ministers and priests and rabbis who tell me that when they take the TCI and they, they don't come out very high in self-transcendence necessarily. Some do and they're very happy, but the ones who don't always tell me that there must be something wrong with the scale because it couldn't be wrong with me. And of course, we all have that problem that none of us are perfect and we're always searching for more coherence and more meaning and purpose in our own. But, but I think also, I mean, just coming back to the health field, I think if we, um, where it really starts to get interesting is again when we don't try to separate out the spiritual from the mental, the mental from the physical, right? So I think, in other words, um, some of this research that uh, my father's been doing in the last 30 years has shown that as people grow in those three character traits, self-directedness, cooperativeness, and self-transcendence, they tend to report greater feelings of um, satisfaction with life, uh, greater positive emotions, fewer negative ones, um, and just generally better psychological well-being, but even physical well-being. Yeah. And so I think that's one of the problems, right, is understanding, in other words, that um, I think reason, for good reason, people are skeptical of people that talk about spirituality at times, because sometimes we confuse magical thinking and superstition yeah. with something truly spiritual. And actually the TCI is useful in that way because um, if we're not uh, higher in something like self-directedness, right? If we don't understand um, purposeful behavior and responsibility, then um, the self-transcendence tends to be more magical and it's, it's not grounded. And so I think that, again, if we can figure out um, professionally, personally, in our treatment, how do we integrate these three lenses and, and look at our patients and our, the people we serve um, to see where they out of balance yeah. between body, mind, and spirit, rather than emphasizing this over that, or you know, but. that's where I think it starts to get interesting. I think that's where uh, a mind-body approach um, or a biopsychosocial approach is more effective. Just, just simply more effective. But just to take some of those points that Kevin said, make them very specific. We initially found that uh, character traits, the profile of character, was strongly related to subjective well-being or happiness. So that if you are, have what we call the creative profile, that self-transcendent, cooperative, and self-directed, all three of those, then you are very happy and you have little negative emotion. But then we did other studies and found that physical well-being, and social well-being also were associated with this. So that you can't really separate physical wellness and social wellness and uh, emotional well-being or cognitive well-being. These all develop together. 
And recently, as we've been working to identify all the genes for human personality, we discovered something that was really pretty remarkable because it turns out that cell transcendence is as heritable as any other personality trait. And the creative character profile has specific sets of genes for it that promote resilience, longevity, and uh, a resistance to injury, both emotional and physical and social. So what we're seeing is that the psychosomatic notion that your personality helps you to make intelligent choices about health behaviors, and that that in turn uh, improves your health, is too simple. That the genes that regulate your character also are the expressed in nearly every organ system. And it's the orchestration, the integration of the regulation of these throughout the whole body that makes a person healthy. And so the psychosomatic medicine, mind-body medicine, is really fundamentally the, the, the biology and the psychology and the sociology of how we reduce stress in the world, how we promote an awareness that allows you to uh, really integrate the functioning of all your organs. We can't just have help from psychiatry or internal medicine or cardiology. It really requires the integration of all these specialty approaches. And we need to focus much more on regulation of stress and modification of lifestyle, which is really the process of development of character. To be able to self-regulate your emotional drives, which may be uh, self-defeating, self-destructive. I think the other, the other piece of it too right, relates to what we started talking about, that the world is changing so quickly. So I think in the past, we could get away with more. In other words, if we only focused on biology, um, the problems weren't as acute and as difficult. So we could get away with a purely biological approach or a purely mental approach and then keep these things separate. But actually, um, now I think with the current conditions, it's not even, it's not only ineffective, it's, it's basically impossible. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's, that's a big part of it. Um, we, we thought, Many people thought that it was enough to just know how to work and love, to be self-directed and cooperative. But since about 1975, 1980, there have been so many people in the world and there's so much pollution and destruction of the environment that we really have to be self-transcendent now, in addition to being self-directed and cooperative. Because without that, we're destroying the world we live in. And that means we're facing uh, a mass destruction of plants and animals, including putting ourselves at risk. And it's very difficult. You can see how resistant governments and pop communities and individuals are to changing their lifestyle to appropriately address this challenge that's, that's threatening uh, our extinction. But we're self-aware, and so for the first time, the dominant species on Earth is a self-aware being who has a capacity, even if we're not very good at it, we have a capacity to do intelligent things to look out for our grandchildren as well as ourselves. I think we have talked about very important issues here. I'm sure you'll have a lot to discuss with the audience now after the video. I would like to thank you very much, Professor Kevin and Professor Hubbard, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.